right. We're going to be uh, going live very soon. Well, I guess you, we are live now since you can hear my voice. I might as well bring in my face. Hey, everybody. Let me lower the sound here. All right. Here we are back again for our um, weekly meeting, our hardware basics, or, well, it's a show where we talk about hardware. This is a 343 TV. You're tuning into 343 TV. Uh, 343 TV comes from 343 Labs. And you know what? I have a friend here. His name is Thomas. Thomas, are you there? Hey. What's going on, everybody? Maybe you could tell us a little more about what we're actually doing here. Sure. So 343 TV is a live stream series that is presented by 343 Labs, which is a wonderful music production school that me and Abe have the pleasure of being a part of. Um, you know, we do a bunch of different stuff, including online classes. Got a location in Manhattan where we started out. Well, uh, and the idea behind 343 TV was that at the beginning of this whole kind of stuck at home situation, we wanted to, you know, branch out to our community and provide, you know, something to keep them busy, keep them working on music and learning new stuff. Um, so we decided to start streaming every day at 1 p.m. So on Fridays we have Bitwig, uh, sorry, I almost mentioned Bitwig Basics, which was uh, Abe's previous show for the first month. But now we're on to Hardware Basics, which is a... Uh, you know, music production hardware focused show, uh, which I've had the pleasure of being a little background man on uh, for the you know time being. And uh, we have a bunch of other great stuff going on every day. You know, everything from training in Logic, uh, training in Ableton, music theory. You got the talk show with Tatro, which is always fun. You know, techno with John Selway. And even uh, a more recent addition is our feedback sessions, which is going to be happening Tomorrow, I should plug that just uh, in case anybody out there has some music they're looking to get some feedback on. It will just be here at 1 o'clock on our YouTube channel. Um, but I think that's kind of the, the basic rundown, you know? All right. Yeah. Um, we're here every Friday. Uh, yep. We have a lot of other shows on 1 o'clock. Uh, you're going to be maybe covering for me one of these days coming up. We've been talking about it, but I'm not sure if uh, it's going to, if you're ready to take the plunge yet. Yeah, but it's definitely in the works. We'll uh, we'll keep everybody updated on that. All right. Uh, okay, so um, you see a lot of people here in the chat, uh, good people. Andrew Duke, again, once again, welcome back. Uh, TWD Industries, uh, he says, I need to watch last week's episode. I haven't gotten enough out of my DFAM. I always feel that way about DFAM. The DFAM is uh, is something really special. I, actually, really, my, one of my favorite machines ever. I have a lot of machines, and I play with a lot of machines. And I think there's like maybe it's right up there with the top three or four, like 303 being one of them, and the DFAM definitely another. And then we could talk about some other ones in, in that kind of Mount Rushmore of, <laughs> of synths for me. Um, but the DFAM is definitely up there. I, and I always feel guilty that I don't play with it more because uh, it sounds so great. Uh, so let's see. What else do we have here? Uh, Robot Sarma Hyperman. So he says Hyperman. I'm not sure what that's relating to. But I think there's some talk in the, um, in the chat, some conversations happening in the chat already. So really nice to see a very lively and full chat earlier on, uh, early on in the show. Mm -hmm. And uh, I wanted to uh, give you guys uh, some encouragement on uh, Andrew Duke says, hey, I say, hey, hey back or hey, Andrew back. Uh, I wanted to give you guys some encouragement on going in here and actually dropping in your questions because I really want to talk about what you guys want to talk about. Um, I see that TWD Industries uh, put a question about uh, any advice on combating gas. <laughs> I don't know exactly what he means, G A S, and he and I figure gas is one thing, but maybe gas is also Germany, Austria, and Switzerland. That's a, a territory. <laughs> I don't know what you mean exactly. Maybe you can clarify that uh, that question. 
so um, we've been compiling questions actually throughout the weeks um, as as they've been coming in um, in and out of different uh, d different platforms. Facebook, a lot of them are coming in on Facebook, and um, and and you know we've just been gathering them together. And I figured today we can do a little bit of uh, answering some of these questions. Um, Maybe we can uh, do them a bit at a time. Uh, I also wanted to go back to our, to our set, something that we've been recording with the live stuff. Let's see what we get time for today. I have Thomas still up here because Thomas is going to help me out reading the questions for me. Uh, so, Thomas, what, uh, what do we have? So, yeah, I have some great questions here that came in uh, from a few different people. Before I go on, I just want to encourage all of you guys to keep submitting these these great questions because... As me and Abe, you know, mentioned in previous episodes, we're really trying to turn this more into an interactive show. So we really appreciate you guys, you know, interacting in the chat and also, you know, sending in these great questions. So to start off, um, I wanted to ask you a great question from Jonas, which I think applies, you know, hopefully to a lot of our audience here at 343 and on 343 TV. It says, Abe, how did you learn about hardware? It seems very complex, and I don't know where to start. Yeah, um, I'm just old <laughs> to begin with. I'm, a, I'm, 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 you know, very old. I started collecting hardware, and why, why did I collect hardware to begin with? Um, I guess it's because um, one day I walked into a music store, and I think I've told this story here before, um, and I saw somebody demoing a, a uh, synthesizer, and it freaked me out. It totally freaked me out. I couldn't. I didn't even know what was going to happen to me that day. I wasn't interested in being a DJ. I was 14 or 13 years old or something like that. I wasn't interested. There wasn't even a DJ thing to think about, you know, the way that we think about it today. I didn't really have it in mind to be a dance music producer or, or even a, you know, audio engineer. Really, I just walked in there because I, I liked playing piano actually, and, uh, and then I saw this synthesizer being demoed and this guy was playing it and turning knobs and making sounds come out and every time he turned a knob another sound would pop out and he would mold the sounds the way he wanted to and it just totally freaked me out didn't know what to do i, I was like i was smitten i it was it was just that from that point on i couldn't do anything else but to think about these things and as I told you, I saved up for a while and I was able to buy my first synthesizer some maybe a year or two later. And uh, and then continued down the path of like collecting these things. Um, didn't really understand them, though, in the beginning. I didn't really didn't really get them. I didn't really uh, I, I knew I could make sounds and I, I wasn't afraid to turn the knob. So I was, you know, making cool sounds with them by just turning whatever, but I didn't know what anything meant. I didn't know what cutoff was or, you know, um, uh, any of the uh, parameters on, on the synthesizer. Uh, but, and then I even started to make music as it came to like, uh, pr producing because I bought some drum machines and, 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 and some samplers. And I did learn a bit more but about synthesis itself. It was a bit of a mystery until much later when I started to really dig in and some friends that were deeper into it started to, uh, to, to kind of open up ideas uh, to me or, or concepts to me. Uh, I know there was one guy, a, a very famous uh, kind of classic legend, his name is Damon Wilde. He kind of used to talk shop a lot with me and, and 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 you know kind of give me some some ideas of like he he taught me what a filter was really um uh then there's also uh guys like Victor Calderon and Jean Lafosse who had this uh group called Program 2 and they had you know a lot going on there as well and I learned slowly by doing and it wasn't until you know to be honest I got really really good at it when um when I started to teach it you don't get as good as something. The best thing you could do for trying to learn something is try to explain it to somebody. <laughs> so, you know, slowly, I, you know, I had accrued the, the, the knowledge, but uh, up until now, up until then, I hadn't really crystallized it into some sort of very easy to kind of uh, talk about concepts. So, sorry, long-winded, uh, uh, Thomas, but that that's how I got into the whole thing, and that's how I learned so much about it. Yeah, no, that's great. And I think that, uh, you know, brings up a really 
a bunch of really valuable points, you know, from what it seems like and some of the stuff you've told me over the, uh, you know, time we've been working and st I studied with Abe, you know, back at DubSpot, but it seems like that you came up in the era where hardware was pretty much the essential. It was, it was everything, you know, in terms of making your own music and performing versus today, it's almost like the go-to things to get on the computer and get these DAWs, which have almost everything you can imagine just right at your disposal. So it's it's almost like everything's been flipped on its head. Well, yeah, it's it's easier to to access, but it's still complex. It's still mm -hmm. it's still something you point. have to kind of kind of study. I mean, the hardware kind in a way makes it easier to get going with because all you have to do is just uh, turn the knobs like a monkey, and then hey, that sounds great. Let's record that. You know, with mm -hmm. it's a little harder to turn that many knobs together in a in, in a in a DAW or in a plugin because well, you have a mouse maybe. And unless you set it up better for a better situation, then you won't be able to do that. But all right. So um, great. So in the meantime, let's hang in there. I'm going to come back to you with a question or two. Do you have to go at 1.30 today or are you? Are you no, oh, I'm all good. good. But I did want to say, uh, you know, welcome to Becky and John who just joined in. And Andrew Duke mentioned in the chat, uh, his GAS was referring to gear acquisition <laughs> syndrome <laughs> buying too much gear and not using it which is something i think me and Ava are both a bit familiar uh, with yeah i know what you mean i'm actually <laughs> trying to sell some gear right now I'm, I'm always selling gear i'm always selling gear that's the thing i'm always buying it and i'm always selling it and it's been kind of a, a really great hobby to have buying and selling because you get to play with it for a while, and if it's not something you must keep for the rest of your life, you can just trade it in for something else, and then you get to play with something else. And you know, I've had the same type of gear a few times in my life. I've had like a, I've had like four Juno one hundred sixes, and I've sold all all three of them. I have one right right now. I sold all three of them, and you know, and and bought them back at different times in my life. So um, it's not a bad thing because usually if you play the used market. Uh, both buying and selling stuff used, you can pretty much sell it for about the same as you um, bought it for, which yep. is super great because you don't lose any money. And in the meantime, you get to um, play with it. And uh, sometimes, a lot of the times, when you buy right, you make a lot more money. Like, you know, if you bought an 808 or something like that um, okay. and, and then decided to sell it sometime down the road. All right. Uh, John H. Kickson says, I miss turning knobs. Uh, yeah, turning knobs is, is magical. But anyway, let me, let me, let's go to, I'm going to go to our project here just to have a look at our project from, uh, from last week's just to see what we got. I remember everything that we did in here, we did, uh, we recorded, uh, live. We recorded from the gear that we have or that, or that have, have sitting around here and let's have a quick listen through to how things are sounding so far so that's a 303 that we recorded that's that kick drum that remember last week we processed Oh, did we not keep the processing for the kick, kick, kick drum? I might have not saved that. We can reprocess it today. And here's the mofo. That's that little yellow box. We should got that going with. And this is something we did last week. What is this? Oh, that's a 303. And then we have a mo the mono tribe. I think of one of the first things that we kind of showed off in there and I'm gonna as it plays I'm gonna re-add that that uh that EQ on the kick drum that Poltec that makes things sound so great That's a big difference. Listen to this. It was almost like what? But now we're here again. It's not getting greedy. Back off just a little bit. Okay, so 
so everything, once again, except for the plugins I'm using now to process some of these things, was done live. And I think we, we ended up last week cutting up this thing and, and kind of uh, processing it with uh, with some some uh, some compression in order to like not make it go because it's getting too loud right now. But anyway, that's what we have right now. And I have my... Um, my little machine ready to um to um where did that go i have my my little setup here where i have the my little let's call this a machine <laughs> but this is basically a, a, a euro rack that i've had with some stuff here from last week i'll switch out maybe next week i'll have a different rack here with some different devices uh, there's a lot we can talk about i was thinking about what we, we could talk about today uh, there's a lot, uh, I have some stuff maybe set up that we can talk about in here. But in the meantime, maybe it's not a bad idea to get uh, Thomas to come back in here and give us another question. Sure, that sounds really good. I was just uh, eyeing this one question uh, that came in from Robert. So what he said is that I've been producing for you with Ableton for years. I've used many plugins since, and I even took a course in sound design to learn how to use them better. These days, I hear a lot of talk about hardware. I even heard some people say that hardware beats the software in sound quality. Um, it's a little long, but he says, I have some friends that use hardware and have been able to play with some of their gear. I think it sounds cool, but I still think my plugins may be better. Honestly, I'm a little confused about the differences what is the benefit of hardware? <laughs> Great question. Uh, let's ask the chat. Let's ask Andrew and, and TWD Industries what they think the benefit of having hardware when you can have mostly everything kind of modeled in, an, in a plug-in uh, these days. I'm really curious to what they would have to say as to, uh, as to that. In the meantime, I could start telling or saying uh, what I think about uh, the benefits of, of actually having hardware uh, being. Uh, well, it's about, look, it, it really, let's, let, let's, let's make a difference in the argument here. A lot of people want to talk about analog, which is, some, and we'll define analog in one way first. We'll say that analog is... Uh, sounds that were made with electrical components, meaning an oscillator, an electrically generated uh, waveform with an oscillator going through a real, you know, phase-based filter. Um, and so all of this is like real-world kind of electronic components that, um, that will actually, you know, um, get you the sound. This is the way that hardware synths work for the most part, especially the older stuff. Um, that is one way of describing analog, and then we'll describe the computer, and we'll call that digital, and that's, you know, even if it's virtual analog, which is still kind of digital, it's modeled inside the computer. So I don't like to at all get involved in that argument, the argument versus analog, the way we describe it, versus digital, the way that you know you see that inside the computers, uh, because I think it's uh, it's great to see to use both. For, in, in my opinion, I think that that um, analog uh, is is one thing, but you to me it's an added level of complexity that you could add that you could put on with a computer. Um, Since like Serum, for example, or would be impossible. <laughs> Not really impossible, but in, super complex to put together in a, as an analog synthesizer. Um, this thing is, you know, Serum, it sounds amazing. And I mean, there's, okay, if you're not into EDM, that might not be uh, your thing because it's overused in EDM. But be, besides the usage of Serum in EDM, uh, it has really a lot to offer, even if you're not making EDM with it. Um, so there's amazing things that come from uh, using the computer. So because of that, I love using the computer. I find that using the computer is, is a great thing. Um, I will describe, though, analog in a different way, and then this is what, where, where I find the, the benefit to analog. Analog meaning that it exists in my same world, 
where I'm able to touch things with turn actual knobs, press actual buttons, and feel like I'm without uh, having to look into a screen of a virtual world that I'm peeking into, I can actually it actually exists in my world. And that will, uh, I'll even move towards devices that are, um, that, that are digitally based, but kind of have analog interfaces. Like uh, you, you have a, a Digitac, I know, um, uh, Thomas, or any number of, of, of really cool uh, devices out there that are digitally based, but have a, the controls are analog, meaning they're in the same world with you. So let's see. Andrew Druk wrote, love the Juno 106, found one in a pawn shop, broken, got it fixed, made so many songs from it before selling. Okay, I thought maybe Andrew was going to answer my question, but uh, yeah, we all love the Juno 106. Matter of fact, I have a Juno 106 that I'm uh, actually getting repaired. Let me show you. Uh, just give me a second. Uh, I think to Abe's point too, I agree very I much I on use the, this. Uh, the physical. I'm show uh, you guys here. So, you there? Yeah, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yep. I was just, uh, you know, kind of going back and agreeing with you. I think that one of the biggest uh, draws to hardware for me is definitely that tactile, you know, the ability to get in there and touch and feel the knobs. It just, you know, you can get MIDI controllers and stuff and kind of resemble that within, you know, the digital world, but it, uh, it's just something else when you really have that, especially like a knob per function kind of setup. Mm. Um, you just get different stuff going on that you almost would never have the capability of doing inside the box. Sure. Um, I, that's that's the world to me. It's really the world to me. So um, let me let me show you my overhead for a second. This is what I went to pick up. So got this here. This is the heart of a Juno 106 synthesizer right there. Wow. Yeah, so this uh, this this synthesizer has five voices, or is it six? Is it one, two, three, four, five, six voices? I think, um, and they're uh, corresponding to these chips here. See these chips? These are these are the, the voices corresponding to these chips. This is how you make the the, the sound. Uh, the thing about this is that uh, it's a known issue with these Juno 106s that you get. Um, you get these uh, chips, which are coated in like this uh, resin. Uh, after a while, the resin sort of melts and starts to short them out. And so mm. some of these voices start to, to go. It's every Juno 106 has to, at one point or another, go through this. So um, what you get is uh, people will resurface these, like pull these out and take off the resin by d dipping them in acetone for, I don't know, a day or two, and then stripping them of the, the, the acetone and, and, and re-soldering them back into there. And so uh, mine have lost, two, two of my voices are kind of dead right now. So this, this, this repair is a must do. So I pulled out the board and I'm sending it off to somebody to do the repair and then send me back this board and then hopefully I'll put it back in and then things will be back again. So um, let's see. Oh, uh, see, Tim Duty is in our uh, chat here. I heard somebody say that with analog, you end up finding the sweet spots a little more easily. And this is, yeah, this is true. I wonder who that was that told you this. Whereas with digital, uh, by way of a computer, it could be trickier to find these spots. Yes, agreed. Agreed 100%. Because of interface and other design aspects associated with analog and plenty of and plenty of digital. So yes, finding the sweet spots, that's that's the thing. Uh, and, and you won't really understand that which was just said about finding the sweet spots with uh, with gear until you try to like play with gear and, and, and realize that you can get at these sweet spots a lot better than, than, than you can by using, say, a mouse or something like that. So thank you, Tim, for that. Um, all right, so um, let's uh, let's get back into this. Do we have time for another question before mid uh, midpoint, uh, Thomas? Sure. Let's see. Um, let's see what we got here. I'll, I'll try to see if there's a good, maybe quicker one. All right. I think this one is probably good. So this is coming from Fernando, and first of all, he says thanks for showing us such cool hardware. I'm having a great time seeing you explain these things. 
So that's very nice. Thank you to Fernando. Um, his question is, can you explain to me what an LFO is? He says, I know it's some sort of oscillator, but I'm not sure how it works. Ah, the LFO. So LFO stands for low frequency oscillator. So let me let me get in here. I think it's probably better, believe it or not. We're talking about digital versus analog. But one of the things that, that is probably easier to do is teach something with a computer. So I'm going to use the Ableton uh, set that I have here to kind of work and show you what an LFO is. So an LFO stands for a low frequency oscillator. So we talked about oscillators a little earlier when we were talking about the sound. And we talked about how oscillators can actually create a waveform that uh, you can hear and then filter and, 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 and go off and have fun with that. But oscillators can also be used as a way to control movement of a parameter over time. So imagine this being a sine wave, right? My hand is a sine wave now. Um, if I get that sine wave to move very low frequency, meaning slow enough so that I could use it to control something. Because the truth is, our range of human hearing is between 20, 20 and 20,000 hertz. So you need at least something as low as 20 times per second right, to happen, which I can't do with my hand. You got to do something as low as 20 times per second for, uh, for, for you, you know, anything lower than that, you're not going to be able to hear it. So uh, a low frequency oscillator operates under that, under that uh, speed or that frequency, 20 hertz and below, sometimes as low as 0.5 or 0.2 or point whatever, 0.02 hertz. So it's moving very slow. One hertz is one cycle per second. So if you want something to do something in cycle per second, remember a sine wave is kind of an even wave. So let's take a, let's take a parameter and... Um, and something in here. Let's uh, let's actually just uh, grab this Bono Tribe and let's do it with the 303. So let's just solo the 303 here and let's add something from I don't know this is auto filter in here. So the idea this has an LFO built in, but the idea with the LFO is that you could tie a parameter, say a frequency, to go with the waveform. So if the waveform would go at this, well, it'd be hard to do with two hands, but let's actually pull in an LFO. I think it's visual, visual uh, is much better. So Max for Live has some pretty nifty LFOs, which you can um, just drop in there and, and they show you the waveform and then it'll show you how you can map that waveform. So I'm just drop that in there. And give it a minute. So there's that waveform, that's that sine wave. It's moving at four hertz, that means it's four cycles per second. You would never be able to hear that, but it's not meant to be heard. You, you, you're, you're meant to control something with it. So let's lower the rate of that to about one hertz, which means about one cycle per second is 0.98, so it's close enough. And that going now at one hertz is going to be able to uh, be mapped to something so you can control the movement of that. So click it on here, click it onto the frequency in here, and now the waveform moves the frequency on that filter. And so now that we play that 303, it'll sound, it'll open and close that way. We could speed up the movement. Maybe we could even change that to musical notes. Now we are 16th notes, giving it a shimmer of sorts. 12th notes, 8th notes, and of course, we can. this is, this is wonderful. The, the idea that you can do it in a note-based setup is the leverage that a DAW can give you. Now, you can't do that mo normally in an LFO on analog stuff. So stuff like, like LFOs are used to make like wobble bases, right? Controlling the, the closing and opening of a filter or, or raising and lowering of a volume level. Uh, but um, you can't really do that perfectly inside of a inside of gear because gear just has a knob and it really you don't know where you're landing. Here you could like break it down. It does the math for you. You can go straight from quarter notes to eighth notes. 
that's the amazing power of using a, a, a DAW to do things or, or, or a computer to do things. So there is something, there's a lot, not just something that, that a computer can do for you in, um, in, in, in the usage of, of making or in the process of making sounds and music. So that's what an LFO is. Let's turn to the, um, so I'm going to turn that and close that off. I'm going to solo everything so that I could just hear the, the, the little rack here that I have. So let's, uh, let me go to my rack here. And let's try to use an LFO here in the rack to do something. That's going to be interesting. So there's a, there's a couple of, there, well, there's a the Mother 32. The Mother 32 is a good one. Um, let's get that to start. Hopefully that'll sync up. So the Mother 32 is going, and I think it's this level here. So now, remember what you just saw, because only in a computer can you have this kind of digital way of, of, of viewing things, or this, this very graphic way of viewing things. But now I have uh, a filter, which I can open and close. But I could set a position like there, a baseline position where it's there. But I could, and then I could add some voltage control filter modulation amount, which is going to be modulated by this LFO at this rate. So you see now the filter is opening and closing, depending on where I have it set, according to this rate. You could speed it up here. or slow it down very powerful very powerful we'll continue that in a minute in the meantime i think it's about halfway point and i think uh thomas has a little bit to share with us yes uh i'll take it away but uh i just wanted to say viewership is up thanks for everybody who's tuning in i was just speaking to max i know he's watching uh also daniel eth who is i think a previous student of abe's uh, text me saying he's tuning in so it's great to see you know some some you know classic members of the community watching the stream but what we're doing here today is a 343 TV episode with Abe and 343 TV is a live stream series that is presented by 343 Labs who are a music production school that is based in Manhattan online as well as more recently in Berlin Germany so if you are interested in taking some music production classes with us outside of these uh, awesome live streams that we're doing, please feel free to head over to 343labs.com for everything you need to know about online and in-person classes in New York City. And if you're interested in Berlin classes specifically, check out 343labs.de. Um, another quick reminder is to subscribe, you know, like the video. We're trying to get this show to be extremely popular, um, you know, don't forget to ask your questions in the chat or if you're watching on Facebook, you know, drop them there on our Facebook page. We're going to kind of continue to, uh, you know, address those questions throughout the next few weeks and going forward on the show. Awesome. I'm just looking at uh, what's going on in the chat and I'm just trying to get, maybe do a little post here on Facebook in the meantime, just to kind of get people to continue to join us because we still have time. Um, I'm just gonna write join us. <laughs> yeah, great. Yeah, we love we love you guys uh, interacting with this show. You know, it's a really big part of us to kind of have the back and forth. I think it uh, makes it a lot more enjoyable for everybody. Yeah, definitely. It, it really feels it, it's a lot of pressure off of uh, Ma um, Max. I mean, Max as well, but Thomas and and myself. And when Max is doing his uh, show as well, when when you have the back and forth uh, going. Uh, because it really feels reactive other than just rambling. Um, mm -hmm. Okay, so um, let me just go back here and look at the chat and see what's going on. All right, cool. People are there. People are writing tons of stuff. I really like to see that. TWD Industry says, I find less analysis paralysis when working with tangible hardware. Yes, 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 yes. On a computer, I can do literally anything and where to start. Uh, can be challenging. I know where to start with hardware tone crafting, and that is a very powerful point. That is an amazingly powerful point because um, what we get in in, uh, in in a computer is really too many possibilities. 
So if I say here, here you have a kick drum machine and and and, and has maybe three thousand presets, or even if you try to ever like use like a, a loop, and you get like hey, or your friend gives you five thousand kick drum samples, <laughs> and now you should pick one out of those five thousand, and you end up being kind of feeling like you're inadequate for not trying to listen to all 5,000 of them before you decide which one is the one that you're going to use. But if you have something that's limiting you from, um, from doing things, then, um, you know, you're just going to make some sound and just going to get something done. So yeah, really great point, TWD Industries. Um, okay, let's, uh, let's get back to where we were with the overhead here. So yeah, so we were at a point where how did I get this going. Um, so we were at a point where we were modulating, and, and when you when you do this, when you do the uh, the uh, the the changing of a parameter over time, you refer to that as modulation. So with the LFO, which is set here, we have a, a triangle waveform set up to uh, for this LFO. With this, which is kind of like a saw, I mean, like a, a sine wave, but is a little more of a, of a triangle pattern instead of like this more even waveform. Very similar, though, if you could imagine going like this versus going like this, right? Uh, but that's what we've chosen now, and now we're going to, once again, listen to that opening and closing. And how much opening and closing? Well, this is the intensity, meaning how far does it get to do it? Just a little bit, a lot more, speed of it. Let's switch the waveform. Now let's go to a square wave. Now the thing about the square wave, the square wave for, for, for modulation is going to be very different because the square wave gives us a situation where it's either on or off. It's like an on-off switch. So it's either here or there. It doesn't have, you know, kind of a gradient or a ramp up like a, a saw would or a triangle would uh, or, or a sine wave. Um, but it will give us some very interesting results. Let's try that. Let's see what happens. Let's take away the amount of, of uh, LFO we're going to use and turn that up again. So we have that. Again, we're controlling the filter, and we're going to see with the square wave what happens. It opens and closes, opens and closes, opens and closes. It's here and here, here and here, here and here. Let's speed that up. Very interesting. All right, maybe we control something else with the LFO. The LFO is sitting here. Well, there's a VCO modulation amount. Modulation means it's going to be related to this modulation de dealing with this LFO. Well, let's see. The VCO is the voltage control oscillator, which means it's the it's basically the, the pitch can be controlled with this LFO. And now look. And now we have we have a situation where we can modulate the pitch with the LFO. And if we do both, and let's do a triangle. We can get some really crazy sounds, and if we speed it up, we can get something close to what you might call FM. Pretty wild, pretty wild and pretty cool. What do you think, Thomas? I think it sounds great, man. It's uh, it's cool to see that you got the stock contained in your in your little uh, setup there. I was wondering, the LFO you're using now is uh, is right on the the unit itself, the 32. Right. Uh, you're not using the LFO in Ableton, right? No, 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 not at all, not at all. The other, gotcha. the, okay. the, the the reason I used the Ableton LFO was to just kind of visually give you some sort of thing to follow. Mm -hmm. um, now, because if I would have showed you here first, you would have been a little confused. If you yep. see it in Ableton, you could see the waveform doing this, and then you could say, well, you're going to tie the parameter to the waveform, and the parameter is going to go for a ride on the wave, and basically it's surfing. LFO yeah. <laughs> is basically surfing. Yeah, I think that might be one one area where the computer kind of has a lot of the hardware beat is 
the visual aspect, you know, oh, totally. representing stuff with graphs and totally, all that. Totally. Yeah. Hey, I it's love computers. I love I'm using a computer right now. <laughs> I love computers and being and, and to me it's just an extension of where, you know, analog or, or this stuff ends. There's this real great reasons for using computers. Uh, but as you might can, can maybe can tell, I also like some gear. Um, right. So uh, one thing I think we forgot to mention earlier was to, if you get a chance, if you like what you're seeing, maybe you could click on that like button. Um, I see some you sometime decide to click on the hate button as well or do not like button. That's fine. Do, do what you want. We're going to get some engagement either way. We're going to see when we're doing good and when we're not. Um, also... You said Max was watching, so that makes me think that we need to hurry up and tell people to subscribe. Because yes, don't don't forget to subscribe. You know, if you're tuning in for this show, <laughs> you're gonna want to catch all the other content that we have uh, daily for you guys. So definitely don't forget to subscribe. Yeah. I think oh. uh, approaching five five k subscribers pretty soon. So. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Subscribe. We're we're trying to get a million by the end of the year. <laughs> And yes. that's that's at least what, what what Thomas has promised Max and and and, and he's told me that and now now I'm like Thomas put us on the you know on the chopping on the hook, so <laughs> he put us on the we're hook. relying on everybody. I see you guys have uh, gone out and and actually uh, hit the like button. That's great. That's that's I saw that kind of popping up. That was that was really nice to see. All right, uh, Thomas. Uh, so that's the LFO and that's the answer to the LFO question. Do we have any more questions? Yeah, we do have uh, one more great question. I, I consider it to be a good one. I think you're going to have uh, some good expertise in the area. So this comes from Julia, and she's asking, um, she's been DJing for three years, and she's talking about, you know, it's gotten very competitive in the DJ space. So she's thinking about incorporating some hardware into her DJ sets. Um, she's not sure if she can necessarily handle a full hardware set at this time, being new to hardware, but she's wondering... How do you think she can get started using hardware, you know, when she's DJing live? Right. So basically, uh, we're talking about a hybrid situation. I've actually been doing uh, a lot of this uh, hybrid action in my last uh, gigs when there were gigs to, ha to be had. Uh, I had um, uh, I, uh, I work with a, a friend of mine, uh, Marco De Prima, and we have this, uh, this kind of setup where he brings out a, a bunch of Eurorack stuff and other pieces of gear, sometimes an octo track, sometimes an analog rhythm, and things like that. And then I'll bring a 303 and, uh, and, and maybe another drum machine, and, but at the same time, DJ. Like, so we, we set it up so we are able to you know, link it up with the clock. With, uh, we've got the special box that actually gives us the, the time code from the CDJs, and we're able to link up the, the, the hardware all to the, to the uh, CDJs. And, and they were able to play back and forth. And it's kind of best of both worlds because we can go live for as long as we want. And then we could jump into a, a track and maybe do a combination of both, which is awesome. But that's a, a pretty advanced setup we've been working on for a very long time and with a lot of effort. Uh, for those that want to just get into it, like how, how can we? I, I think there, there's, there's some nice things that you can get. Um, for example, uh, Thomas has that Digitac, and some other people have like drum machines. Drum machines are great because um, you can play them, uh, and you could set the tempo to them, uh, and you have usually a nice little digital readout to as to what the tempo may be, which is pretty awesome because uh, if you look at the CDJs when you're DJing, you also have a readout of what the tempo should be. So if there's like a you know. If you look at your CDJ while it's playing, you know, it could be you're playing at 128.7, and it'll tell you up to the to decimal point as well. Um, when, when, you, when you have that going on, then you could imagine in one of your empty channels on your, on your um, mixer, maybe if you just brought your Digitac, let's say, and uh, set the tempo on it to 128.7, and it's going to be a little tougher if you want to do kick drums because if they don't match exactly then you can have a little bit of kind of uh, sneakers in the in the wash uh, or in in the dryer situation uh but if you have let's say um uh, some hi hats or some percussion pattern or some it's a, the, the digitech allows you to do samples so you could do some crazy sampling stuff and then you just hit play on that pattern uh 
in beat, of course, just the same way you would hit play on on a, on us and then an opposite CDJ to get them to play together. You just hit that, and it's just kind of another deck. You, you you're gonna be in the in the right tempo. And these days, these machines are so tight, the way that they um, that they play, that uh, that you'll be able to hit that and hold those two things together for sometimes minutes at a time without it drifting at all in timing, which is great which is amazing because it's just a way to like suddenly you have another dimension which you have different control over. Maybe you could work some filters on that thing. Maybe you could change uh, some other parameters in that thing which will get you um, to have a lot of fun with that. I, one of the things I like to do is bring out my, um, uh, I have that, that 303 that I showed you guys, that TT303. Uh, it's, a, it's a pretty cool, it's not as expensive as the original so I'm not worried about bringing it to a club or a venue. I stopped bringing my, my original TB303 to clubs because it's just so expensive right now. And, you know, having somebody pour a beer over it or something like that is just not fun. So, uh, but this thing is like a tenth of the price of that. And it sounds pretty much the same as that. So uh, I'm fine with bringing it to a club. I'll bring that with a drum machine because I do need the clock from a drum machine to dial in perfectly the time. So if I say we're at 128.7, I dial it in the drum machine, I have a MIDI cable going out to the TT303, and then the output going from the TT303 into a, a, a channel on a, on a mixer. And then as it's playing, I'll just start the, the drum machine. Now the drum machine could be muted or, or, or the level could be, you know, all the way down so you don't hear what's coming from the drum machine. Uh, or even just not plugged in. But then the 303 will come through on one of the channels and you could like do all these cool bass lines and stuff like that right over the tracks that you're playing. Uh, and it's a really great way to like expand and to to give new dimension to your mix. Because these days, uh, you know, uh, you know, or at least before we stopped having parties, so I, I hear a lot of parties going on there, you guys, that you guys are, are, are holding. Uh, <laughs> Thomas laughs, but, you know, he's been going to these secret raves, I know, that... And <laughs> somewhere in the dark parts of Connecticut. Anyway, uh, the, the, these days, you know, people want to see more than just uh, a CDJ action because the truth is CDJ action is available for everyone if you had mm -hmm. a CDJ or one of those controllers. So, yeah, that's a kind of a long-winded response to that. Oh, Max is actually in the, in the mix here in the, um, in the chat. Uh, yes. Did you write back? Did you tell them we're working on our 1 million subscribers? Cause, yeah, know. <laughs> yeah, we should just let them know. You know, we are we are shooting for 1 million subscribers by the end of the year. <laughs> that's that's the update, Max, uh, trying to keep everybody satisfied with that. Um, just to touch on what you were just discussing, I had two quick follow-up questions. The first would be, what sort of drum machine uh, would you use in that scenario alongside the TB or TT303? If you, I'm just curious what kind of your go-to device would be well right now so, right now i like uh, i really like to use for that scenario something like what you have the digitac which mm -hmm. is small easy to carry and relatively not breaking the bank meaning it's not a five thousand uh, dollars drum machine like uh like an 808 um yep. and uh, and or something less than that for example arturia makes some drum machines i believe and and yep. i think my favorite one is this um uh, if I could pull it up and actually get it to show here, uh, gotta pull it in here. Is this guy over here? This is the uh, the the TR8, the first edition, not the second edition. The first. Gotcha. Edition. Yeah, I was just thinking the same that you know kind of goes hand in hand with something like the Digitac, or similar price point. Uh, the T the TR8 probably would be great for that kind of scenario. Yeah, the first edition is cheap now because the second one came out and has sampling capability and all this stuff. But the first one, it sounds great, and it's a pretty pretty awesome drum machine. And you probably can pick it up around 300 bucks, maybe even less, wow. between two and $300 if you hunt around. You can get one of those for that. And that in itself, just to produce with that, it sounds pretty – I mean, I have a real 808 and a real 909, and the truth is, you know, this thing is not that – far off from what it sounds like yeah so, maybe even the uh the tr08 which is something we had mentioned you know oh, would yeah. fit the bill pretty good in this scenario too TR08, uh, my other, i was sorry, sorry just to, before you go on uh the tr08 i was looking at prices for that they're still they're pretty well real price these days i think they're like 379 you can find them new uh but the one that that kind of i don't know went off somehow out of control and started to to to, to moon in the price 
was the uh, the TR09. That one's like okay. seven fifty now. They they both started at the same price, but now they, they don't make them anymore. So the used market, they have the the seven fifty. Uh, somebody writes a seven MC seven hundred seven groove box. Yeah, that's really cool, but it's a, it's not cheap and it's new. Um, it's not super cheap. Uh, I feel like the TR eight is the most common one uh, in live technos I've seen. Yeah, because it's so it's cheap and 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 and, and kind of I wouldn't say disposable, but uh, if if you're not gonna cry as much if somebody pours beer over it as if you had your uh, 808 at a club and somebody poured your beer over it or, yeah or it's their a lot beer easier over. probably to get your hands on a on a new tr8 you know yeah another 200 bucks but you know I, I used to bring out all my like drum machines to clubs when i used to play live i used to bring my 909 all the time and my 808 all the time and the last time I brought my 808 out, I think I played here in New York. It was sometime around the early 2000s, and somebody stole my tempo knob. <laughs> Just walked up to it while I wasn't looking, pulled off my tempo knob. I got home, tempo knob's not there anymore. It's like, what wow. the hell? <laughs> you know, that was it. I was like, nah, never again. I'm not bringing this this stuff out there. This stuff is more to kind of hold for for a while at home and keep it mm -hmm. safe. But there's plenty of good stuff that's that's. Uh, I wouldn't say inexpensive, but more on the inexpensive side. Yeah, I agree. And one more thing while we're on the topic of Roland, I know that some of their DJ controllers have a TR8-like um, kind of drum machine sequencing built in. And another really cool feature of them is that I think all of them have a MIDI uh, out or some sort of MIDI sync. So, you know, if you were able to get your hands on that or, you know, maybe a certain type of interface that has the MIDI sync while playing live, I think that could really come into play mm. in this kind of scenario. Right. Uh, we have a question here uh, that we should maybe write down, Thomas. Uh, for, sure. For, for the show, it says, could, uh, f uh, Frank, I guess, Vivas, asked, could we go over patching the um, M32? I guess he refers to the Mother 32. That's the, the device I was using to show the LFO. Maybe if you could like uh, save that question for, a, for, for another show. Uh, we can we could do it as early as maybe next show, just to um, just to get to that question. But I don't think we'll have enough time uh, left over to really deal with that um, in earnest because there's a lot to talk about when it comes to patching. And what he means by patching is being able to plug into these little, this little. Uh, hold on, let me show you these little patch points where these little cables can go into, um, and we can do stuff with. So. Maybe I'll show you what it what what, what that means, um, just a bit now, and, and we'll see. We, we'll expand on that more later. We have a few minutes left, and uh, maybe we can do a little bit of this. So, so here's the output. Take out these the LFO modulation from these guys here, and let this play in there. So the output of this guy comes out of this top right hand corner which is the VCA this is the voltage controlled amplifier the output goes then I can go directly into this guy here which is serving as my little mixer this uh, Ramona um, kind of little kind of, it's a two channel mixer I guess uh, but and which you know I can go directly here and then we have that ready to go but through the magic of patching we could take it to something else we can and that's the other one you hear when i unpatch it it goes into that but i could take the output of this effect and patch the output of this into the input of the effect and now it goes through the effect which now lets me have fun with with the effect that is set up here now, there's also really a lot of cool things that we could do with this um, right now the tempo is not matched so i'm gonna grab the gate out of this here it's gonna give me a, a clock so i could match the tempo off of this thing now the tempo on the on the clock of the effect works but remember this was dry and now this is with the this ecophone crazy effect. Once again, off, on. 
so that's the that, that's the, the the magic of of what uh, patching can do for us, which it, it means that it can uh, we can take anything that's coming out on any of these points and and re redirect them through different pathways. Um, the, the the synthesizers you buy that don't have these patch points um, have already all these connections made inside of the of the synthesizer, and what happens is that the patch points. Um, in in the sense that have only patch points, you really do have to find a, a, a way to like give it some architecture, give it a, a path to the, for the signal to flow and to and and for to to be modulated. Uh, well, devices like the Mother Thirty Two are kind of semi modular in the sense that there's already a routing, an internal routing to everything, but the, it also gives you all the patch points so that you could kind of mess with that internal routing and change it. So it's kind of best of both best of both worlds. It's a hybrid between a purely um, uh, modular device where it's just an oscillator, which you have to patch right into a filter to get that to work. Uh, this is already an oscillator pre-patched into a filter. But I can take the filter input or whatever and reroute it from other places, do other crazy things, send it out to other devices, come back and create a whole new thing uh, or a whole, whole new uh, set, set up for the way that the sound is going to be delivered. So uh, that's what patching is all about. We could talk about patching more of the Mother 32 maybe next week or something like that. So let's uh, make sure we remember that. So um, we're doing good. Uh, it's, a great, uh, it's a great show uh, today. I'm really feeling uh, uh, you guys. You guys are really active in the chat, which is really fun. Um, Let's get Thomas here to join us. And, uh, you know, lots of really fun things. I think uh, um, Andrew Duke is even talking about his divorce on here. <laughs> uh, I'm just reading what I what would you write, Andrew. Uh, after my divorce, the only hardware I had was left it was my laptop. Since then, I have got a machine and a complete keyboard. Yeah, um, we do build again. And we that's always the fun part, that we can get to build again. Um, and uh, and he thanks me for all this these tips, and I, uh, yeah, well, you, you're welcome. I, I I I know about Andrew forever. Andrew's been is one of the uh, old Star Wars of everything, when it comes to techno and and sound and and, and so forth. Um, okay, uh, Thomas, I think we're getting towards that end point of the show where we need to say start thinking about saying goodbye. What do you think? Yeah, I agree. I think uh, I just want to mention, keep the questions coming. I know we have a few that came in the chat, you know, just now towards the end of the show. I'm going to save those. Uh, Becky Locke, we got your question. Um, but, you know, throughout the week, if anything comes up, just hit us up. You can, you know, eat me at Thomas at 243 Labs or, you know, drop a comment on, you know, the replay of this video or, you know, any way you can contact us. We'll be looking out for questions. Uh, we definitely want to keep those coming in and, I'd say uh, this was probably our most successful. Looking forward to see what the the future holds. Well, you cut off for a little bit. You said it was one, our most, and then <laughs> it cut off. Oh, I was. Can you hear me all right now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just want to say I think it's uh, you know been our most successful Q and A show as far as you know hardware basics has gone, and I'm definitely looking forward to you know keeping that going hey, hey to be honest thomas if if this turns into only q and I would i would love it because i just really really feeling being here with you guys giving me your questions and we going back and forth with you you guys also responding on the chat talking to each other getting a whole forum going with uh with with, with what it is to to love hardware uh or maybe even hate hardware um yep. so so yeah keep those questions coming i really would love to turn this into more of a of this and, and less of uh, us rambling. Um, but thank you so much, everybody, for joining us this week. Thank you for, you know, th those of you that are here every week. It's, it's amazing to see you guys here every week. It makes us feel good. It makes us feel like, you know, we have something going on. We have a little, we have a little gang here, a little club that we're part of. Um, Thomas, uh, is there any other announcements you need to make before we go? Any upcoming classes you want to talk about or any... Um, um, sure, that's a good point. So this weekend we got a songwriting class starting for anybody who's interested. Uh, that's an online class. We do have some in-person classes starting up very soon in New York City. So if you're interested in any of those, 
uh, class, check out 343labs.com. And lastly, I did want to mention, and thanks for reminding me, we have a mixing course starting in Berlin, which, uh, you know, we still have a few spaces left. You know, it's been uh, a lot of demand there, but I wanted to plug that. So if you are over there in Europe, check out 343labs.de and uh, you can find all the info Do you have any dates there. for that? Um, I believe it should be starting, uh, if not towards the end of the month, right at the beginning of September. Right on. Okay. All right. Uh, let's uh, end the show. I, for the end of the show, I'm going to play the same end uh, set that I did last week. Uh, I had been playing the same end set for like weeks and weeks and weeks, and I found another one. Um, I'll, I'll look for another one for next week, but uh, we'll just go off with, uh, with this uh, kind of setup. Uh, and before we go, I think uh, Robert Tarma asks uh, the, about the Volca FM that I use in this set. Uh, I think it's it's a really great, probably my favorite of all the Volcos, the Volca FM. Some of them are a little dinky, some of the other uh, Volcos. Some of them are, you know, I don't really like the, the, the bass line one. And, and, uh, and, and not, not too many of them really shine for me. I haven't tried every single one of them, to be honest, but... Uh, I think for me the FM is the one that 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 that's, that stands out and and is a must have. Um, it, it is basically a baby DX7. Um, all right. With that said, we'll say goodbye for now, and we'll uh, talk talk with you guys next week. Bye, Thomas. Hey.